Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be going over the game that I played in the sixth round of the FIDE Grand Prix here in Berlin, Germany. Now in this game I was playing as Andre Esipenko, the young and super talented Russian junior player. Of course I was leading my group by half a point, so this game was super critical. If I were to draw the game or win the game, I would qualify for the semifinal match uh, starting in two days. If I were to lose to Andre, Andre would overtake me and he would win the group and he would qualify himself. So very, very critical game. A lot of pressure on both of us. So the game starts e4, I play e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, and now Andre plays the move bishop to c4 here. Again, I wasn't really sure what Andre would do, but being as it was a must-win situation, I didn't really think he was going to go into the Berlin. Um, maybe he could have played d4, c4 on move 1, but the Gucci piano is an opening where all the pieces stay on. Additionally, Andre had a very important win against Magnus Carlsen, the world champion in the FIDE World Cup. Uh, about six or seven months ago, I think it was. So I, I suspected he might try this once again. So I play bishop c5, Andre goes d3, play knight f6, a4. Now this is the first sort of surprise for me, seeing a4. I wasn't really sure if he'd play c3, castles, knight d2, a4, some other move. But again, in the Gucci piano, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of different move orders, so it wasn't all that surprising. So he played a4, now I played a6. He castles, and I play d6. Very standard setup, by the way. A lot of people will notice that in many of my recent events, for example, say the World Blitz and Rapid, I've actually played different systems with like d5, for example, or also systems with a5 preventing b4 pawn push and the queenside expansion. All right, so a4 is played. a6, castles, d6, all very standard. a5, bishop a7, c3, and now I castle, h3, h6. Very logical, creating the luft here. Uh, since we are in Germany, of course, as those of you who speak Deutsch know, Luft means like sort of the air of the space. Uh, obviously, there is the, the classic word Lufthansa as well. All right, so h3, h6, bishop e3 is played. And now I did something that's not best. I played rook e8. Now, the idea behind rook e8 was very simple. But let's say white trades on a7, plays knight e2. I can just go bishop e6, exchange all the bishops, and we play a game of knights here. And again, I have a break in the center with d5. I can just bring the rook back to a8, play queen d7, and rook d8 or rook e8 later. Should be completely fine for black. So again, um, definitely, uh, definitely, Andre would not want this because, of course, this is a must-win situation for him. So he chooses to play queen b3 here, attacking the pawn on f7. Now, one thing that you always have to be aware of is differences in position. So, for example, if we go back here to this position after knight d2, rook e8, queen to b3. I've actually had this position. I played this with white against Alexander Grishuk in the FIDE Grand Prix in 2019 in Moscow. Now, in that, in that game, I played, or I was white, sorry. So in that game, Alexander played queen d7, followed by his b5 pawn push. Uh, but there is one big difference here with this position, is that there's no bishop on e3. So when bishop e3, rook e8, queen b3 happens, my first instinct is play queen d7, knight d2, and then try to go b5. However, because the bishop's on e3 versus c1 in this position, the line doesn't quite work out as white can trade. And now play bishop takes a6. I play knight a5 here, just bishop c8, rook c8, and queen c2, and white is just up a pawn and completely winning. So again, I was thinking about this throughout the game, or, or during the game, I was trying to figure out, well, what's the difference? And it's really, really critical that instead of just doing pure calculations, you also try to think about the structures of the piece placement in conjunction with other games you've played in these openings. So after queen b3, I go queen e7, Andre plays knight bd2, and now I play rook b8. Now this is probably really the start of going wrong. At this point, I was really quite unsure of what was happening. I still was really insistent on trying to play bishop e6 and play something very classical. Already here after knight bd2, I probably should have admitted my error and gone bishop takes e3, f takes e3. Now again, this looks very scary because you open up this f file, there's knight h4, knight f5, knight g6 as well. But after a very simple move like knight to d8, knight to h4, and something like bishop e6 here, oddly enough, after knight to f5, you can just take and play c6, followed by knight e6, and black should be okay. Again, with a, with a computer engine to aid in the analysis, it's very, it's very easy to see it's okay. But from afar, it feels very scary just because of pressure on this f file and the f7 point as well. So I chose not to do that. Instead, I play rook to b8, and Andre goes bishop takes a7, knight takes a7, and now he plays d4. Now, this is the first spot where he had a choice. Now, there were a couple moments where he could have played this move, bishop takes a6. Now, here, if I take, he just takes the rook. But if bishop a6, I have this very creative move, bishop takes h3. And now if bishop takes b7, I can go bishop to e6, attacking the queen, c4, and knight d7. And black should be completely fine here. This pin is very strong. A sample line would be a6, 
knight to c5, forking the queen and the bishop, queen to c3, takes, takes, and rook b7. Material is even. Center is pretty compact for both sides. Not a lot is happening, so black should be fine. And again, material has been exchanged, which makes it much more likely that I would be able to draw this game. So after knight a7, Andre plays d4. Classic move in the Italian, just build the center. One thing that you should realize in the Italian, and this is a general theme, so it's not always true, but generally whoever gets the break, um, let me just move the knights to illustrate it. Whoever gets the break, let's say white gets d4, generally white is better. Conversely, let's say we get some position like this, for example. If black gets a d5 break first, generally black should be completely fine. Additionally, the same thing applies to f4 as well. Say white can play f4 here before black can play f5, generally white is better. Whereas say we get to a position like this and I get f5 first, black is usually completely, uh, has completely equalized. So in the Italian, general, the general, general belief is that whoever gets the break first with f4, f5 or d4, d5 should be better. So white should be a little bit better here since d4 is playable and the e4 pawn is not under attack. So now here I took a long time and I played this move knight to c6. Now this is very clearly a blunder um, and it's based on a pure miscalculation. Now there are many things I thought about here. One line that I really wanted to play was initially I wanted to go bishop d7 and the idea is that let's say white plays rook e1, I can play bishop to b5 and after we trade the bishops here we play a game of knights again. White is maybe a little bit better, he has a bigger center, but I suspect that black should be fine. However, I was very close to playing this move when I realized that there was this idea with pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, knight takes pawn. And now after queen e5, bishop takes f7, king h8, bishop e8, bishop e8, rook a e1. Black has a bishop and a knight for the rook, but white additionally has two central pawns. And I sort of got some PTSD uh, from a previous game I played. So while I wasn't sure what was going on here, I lost a very critical game in the World Cup in 2017 to Vladimir Fedosev, which I'm going to show you guys a little bit, bit of. It's slightly different, but same kind of situation where let's go back to the opening. Uh, I'm playing with the black pieces, obviously, here. And Vladimir sacked a bishop and a knight for a rook. And so we got to this position where, essentially here, white has two pawns and a rook for a bishop and a knight. Now, obviously, it's a little bit different here relative to the game that I played, but I did go on to lose this game, and that was in the back of my memory as I was playing this, as I was playing this game, um, that I did not want this to happen. So that's why I chose not to go for this bishop d7 move. Now, oddly enough, the computer says that black that black should be okay um, in this position after rook a e1 or after bishop b8 rook a e1, something like queen takes a5. But still, even after e5 and f4, it has shades of the of the, of the game against the fish, where white gets these four pawns on the king side. And after losing that game, and then as I was thinking through my mind, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to even take that chance. So instead, I play the move knight to c6, bringing the knight back to the, a nice square, putting pressure on the pawn d4, and additionally targeting the pawn a5. However, this is actually a big mistake. And the reason this is a big mistake here is that now white can actually play this move d5. And after knight to a7, white can grab the juicer on a6. Now I take on h3. And after bishop b7, there's a big difference here. In the previous line, remember, I could go to e6. That's not available here, so I have to go bishop c8 a6 here and my whole intention was to play this move knight d7 but the computer refu refutes this very cleanly by playing c4 knight to c5 queen to e3 and now when i take and take back there's this very dirty move b4 and i can't save both the knights if i move the knight from c5 i lose the knight on a7 um if i take the pawn I, he just takes my knight so i can't save both of these ponies uh because of the the double attack here so Andre missed a huge opportunity here because this was my intention. I will be very clear. My intention, I thought, was knight d7, knight c5, and I should be fine. I just overlooked c4. So if Andre had played this move, bishop takes a6, maybe I would have come with something different here after bishop b7, but it would have been very, very scary. I probably would have had to go like bishop g4 and some kind of knight h5, knight f4, and hope for counterplay. But realistically, white should be doing very, very well here. So instead, Andre plays rook fe1, very solid move. This also gave me some insight as well into where Andre's mind was, because at this point he was trying to just play for the, the, the good technical advantage versus trying to blow me off the board. Now in this position, I used a lot of time. I think I used maybe 25 minutes before playing this move bishop d7. Now one of the reasons I used a bunch of time is that for the longest time, I wanted to play knight h5 here with the idea that if white goes knight f1, I can go queen f6, knight to e3, and now I bishop takes h3. If knight d5, queen g6, knight h4, queen g5, black is much better. Um, additionally, if white plays, 
well i guess 93 just doesn't work actually so let, let, let me let me leave it there and the thing is though after 90 h5 i used 20 plus minutes trying to calculate this this line with d5 97 bishop a6 now you probably wonder well what's the difference between this and the other line but the reason i use so much time is because here after takes and bishop b7 my knight my knight is not going to c5 my knight is on h5 versus being on f6 and so i spent a lot of time and i was trying really really hard to make these lines work i don't think the order matters whether it's knight f4 or queen d7 but just to show you guys queen d7 takes queen h3 rook e3 knight f4 threatening checkmate on g2 but after knight e1 queen g4 white side steps i don't have a mate and now after queen h5 white can just go knight ef knight df3 and after queen h1 knight g1 there are no checks knight on e1 covers a g2 square i don't have knight h3 because of rook takes h3 and i very promptly resign the game here so i spent a lot of time here trying to make this knight h5 sack work with, with this whole bishop a3 but finally after using about 20 minutes and not really finding where it was i decided okay well you have to be practical at this point i was already down about 25 minutes on the clock just play moves that make sense don't think too long so i play bishop d7 d5 knight a7 bishop f1 now one thing we talked about yesterday and again getting back to very basic principles it's really important to keep in mind is that what does white have here there's one thing white has a lot more space white can play c4 b4 c5 white has more space in the center additionally so white has much more space so what do we do when your opponent has much more space now we covered this in my game against grishak yesterday and the same rule applies here when you have less space in position look look to exchange minor pieces or look for pawn breaks so we look at pawn breaks here if i go c6 white can play c4 for example nothing really is happening here in the center so i don't have a good pawn break there so I don't have a good pawn break here. So what is the other pawn break I have? The other pawn break I have is to go knight h7 followed by f5. And additionally, by playing knight h7 here after c4, we follow the basic rules. And now I go knight to g5, exchanging minor pieces and also playing for the pawn break at the same time since I have less space. Now that's a very dank sort of theme. It's not something that is easily applicable if you're not above a certain rating, but it's something to keep in mind if you're, say, master level or higher, where if your opponent has a lot more space on the board, you don't have like a big attack, like say the King's in here or something, look for ways to exchange minor pieces or look for pawn breaks. So I play knight g5. Andre plays queen e3. I trade the knights and now I go knight c8. I could have tried c5 here, but after b4, it's getting pretty ugly. I can play like rook c8, but after rook b1, feels like something bad is happening here on the queen side and i think white is white is on his way to winning so instead i play knight to c8 andre plays b4 and now i play f5 idea is very simple here obviously i i am definitely worse here i don't have a pawn break but how can i get what are, what are my issues here i have less space obviously and i'm a very passive knight so by playing f5 here my idea is very simple let's just say white plays some wasteful moves queen king h1 queen f6 king g1 if i get my knight to e7 it can go to f5 or g6 and suddenly just like that black should be completely fine here so after f5 he plays bishop d3 now i go queen f6 again trying to activate my knight get it to e7 and maybe f5 so andre takes here and oddly enough this is a fairly severe mistake by andre weirdly enough um weirdly enough if white plays rook a c1 knight to e7 and c5 the computer says that after takes and bishop f5 white is still better but like i said you can tell that my knight is now getting active there isn't a quick breakthrough on the queen side either so it's almost okay for black computer obviously would just win this game with white but from a human perspective you feel like you kind of missed something here and you're only a little bit better so here andre takes on f5 we trade and he goes knight d4 i play queen f7 and now he plays f4 now it's worth noting that knight e6 is the first obvious instinct at, because you have this great bastion here with the pawn on d5 and supported by the pawn on c4 supporting the knight but i can actually undermine the knight here by going c6 and after queen d2 i just trade go knight e7 and my next move will be knight takes pawn so let's say white plays rook d1 i can just go knight takes pawn and sure white can trade on trade on g7 and d5 but again it's a rook and pawn end game and while white is better there are good drawing chances so andre plays the move f4 here now the idea behind f4 is very simple i can't move the pawn because white will capture the rook now it's in this faithful position i had spent all this time by the way when i when i was debating queen f6 i spent i think about 10 minutes five to ten minutes and it and i blitzed out my next move because i saw this line and i very proudly played c6 now oddly enough this is a blunder there's a very beautiful move here that i was uh that i that was pointed out to me in the press conference when i gave an interview after the game which is a very tricky move knight to b6 now the reason it's such a great move 
is that if white takes knight, I can now take the knight because now my rooks are connected. So knight b6 connects the rooks on the 8th rank. Additionally, if white moves the knight, I just take a pawn for free. So white really doesn't have a choice here. He has to take, and after pawn takes knight, queen takes pawn, pawn takes pawn. If white takes on b6, black can take on f4. If white doesn't take on b6 here, then it should be a pretty easy draw for black, even material, and black controls the open file. So therefore, this was a very big miss by me. If I played knight b6, I could have probably finished the game about two hours earlier, saved myself a few years, a uh, few years of my life, because I probably lost a few years with the stress that occurred in the end game later on. Um, at any rate, it was a big miss. But the line that I calculated when I was calculating queen f6 was what I blitzed out, which is c6. Now, initially, I actually underestimated this pawn takes pawn, which was played in the game. The line that I was expecting was pawn takes pawn. And I thought after knight a7, I was okay. But weirdly enough, after knight f5 takes queen a7, b takes c6, f takes e5, white is just much better here. Um, if I play rook takes b4, white can just take the pawn. If I play pawn takes pawn, after queen a6, Rook c8, probably after move like rook a b1, white should be winning long term. Again, during the game, somehow I just felt that after um, that after like queen a6, there, there was something like, I think I thought during the game I might even be able to play like queen f4 and something like check and rook c8. But again, computer basically says after queen d7, if I capture just a6, a7. And even though material is even here, with an active, active rook behind the passed pawn, another passed pawn with b file, this should be winning for white. So... I got up a little bit lucky, I think you could say. However, as I said, I thought after pawn takes pawn knight e7, I was completely fine. But as it turns out, after this capture, f takes e5, there still are a lot of problems here as well. So in this position, there are a couple options. The first one is to take with the pawn. But after knight to e6, let's say I play knight d6 here, uh, or let's say I trade on d5 and go knight e7, you'll notice after queen e5, I cannot take the pawn because white is now guarding the knight twice. So if this happens, white gets this great outpost, this bastion on e6, as, as uh, Felix would call it. So it's not really working. The other move I can try is knight d6, but after rook c1, knight takes pawn, rook takes knight, pawn takes pawn. You think, wait, you're attacking the rook, the knight, everything is very hunky-dory here. But white can actually play knight g7, pawn takes rook, knight takes rook, rook takes knight, and after queen h6, Again, material is even here, but I have two weak pawns, and my king is very naked here on g8. There are ideas like rookie three, rookie g3, rookie four, g4, and white should be white should be winning here. So therefore, I can't really take. So then the other option is to play rook takes e5. Well, there are three options, but this was the other one that I calculated. But after queen g3 here, rook to g5, queen to h4. I thought after 97, 96, I was in really bad shape. Of course, computers are stronger than humans, so the computer actually says that after rook g6 here. Rook f1, knight f5, that queen f4, rook f6 is holding. Again, very, very tough to spot, and it just feels very wrong, especially with this knight on e6 that is so, so, uh, that's just so well positioned. At any rate, I play the third option. So I was unhappy with both those options, so I take the pawn. And now here, Andre plays e6. I go queen g6. Initially, I wanted to play queen h5, try to guard this pawn, rather than, than end up down a pawn. But after this move, g4 here, queen g6, knight f5, with this great knife on f5 here, I think white is probably close to winning. Again, I can't remove it, and my knight on c8 is just so bad. So say like d takes c4, something like rook a c1 or e7, it feels like white is white should be winning technically. So I didn't want to do that, so I go queen g6. And now Andre surprised me. He played rook f1. Initially, I expected pawn takes pawn. Knight e7 is something like queen b3. And after queen g5, rook a d1. Point being that if I trade on d5 here, even though material is even, after knight f5 again, I have big problems. Let's say I take on b4, knight d6. If rook f8, e7 just wins the game. If I go rook e7, knight f5, rook e8, he is rook d7. And again, this knife is just crushing. So because of that, I was, I was expecting this to happen. I thought after rook d1, I could play like rook bc8. Marginally worse here, um, but I felt that I had good drawing chances because in this position, white doesn't really have a way to proceed. And if I can get some stabilization, this pawn on d5 will always be a weakness. So instead, rook f1 is played here. Now, this is a mistake because of, because of the ordering. So here I go knight e7. Now, what should have happened is I should have taken first and after rook f7, played knight e7 to transpose into the game. But by playing knight e7 first, Andre actually had the option again to take the pawn. And if I take back, white can oddly enough just go queen e2 here. And again, this threat of knight f5, the sort of maybe rook a3, king h2, and rook g3 even, is extremely strong here for white. So all these ideas combined with this protected pass pawn on e6 make the position overwhelmingly favorable for white.
Andre instead plays rook f7. Now I correctly capture on c4, and he plays rook f1. And this is where, at this point, both of us were pretty low on time, and I make a mistake. I play this move king h8. Now, as it turns out, there's this very computerish line which holds a draw here, which no one would have played, which is this move queen d3, queen f4, and now I have knight g6. Now, I actually saw this initially, but the move that I was worried about was queen g4. And I thought, okay, knight f5 is coming, g7 is weak, what do I do? Like, for example, say I go c3, knight f5, and boom, 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 g7, h6, I just resign. But the computer, of course, being a computer, says that after this move h5 here, attacking the queen, if white takes the pawn, I take the knight with check. And so the queen is kind of overloaded. You'll notice there are no squares to go to in order to guard the knight. However, after this move, rook takes g7, king takes g7, there's knight f5, King f6 here. White cannot move the knight, creating the discover check, because then I take the rook with check. King f1, pawn takes queen is winning. And after queen h5, computer says nobody cares. You can just play this very quiet move, rook to f8 here, and black is completely fine. Again, not human whatsoever. You walk into 20 discoveries under the sun, um, but the computer says it's fine. So this would have been one way to maybe make a draw. Again, with very limited time, I think if I had played queen d3, there's probably a 90% chance that I lose the game. So I play king h8, maybe even higher than that. So I go king h8, and the idea behind king h8 is very simple. I wanted to play knight c6 here as well, but after knight f5, I can't take the rook because then he takes with check. And if I take the pawn here on e6 with the rook, he checks, queen takes, queen takes rook check, queen f7, but he has knight h6 with the classic fork. So I don't want to do that. Um, so I figure, okay, I go king h8. So now when he plays, plays a move like rook f3, knight c6, if he plays knight f5 here, I just take the rook. He takes. Actually, wait, no, sorry, I don't take. Sorry, because in this one, if I take, I think after rook e3, right, white's still winning. But after knight f5, I go rook takes e6, rook takes g7, and then I have the very nice move queen takes f5 here. And after, let's say white takes, I can just take the queen, and um, and so it should be should be good for black. I guess actually queen f5 apparently is not the not the actual win. There's also just takes and trade in c3, and I guess the pass pawn rules the day as well. But that's sort of beside the point. But the reason I did this was specifically so that I could take and it would not be a check. However, as it turns out, after rook f3, the concept with knight c6 is wrong. Now, again, I was very low on time. I used up a lot of time already. Uh, the only way really to continue here would have been knight d5, queen f2, queen to e4. And once again, it looks very scary. If white tries rook g3 to stack on the 7th, I can go rook g8, rook g4, and queen e3. Should be okay. Should be okay for black. But very, uh, very, very tricky. Very tricky. Also, after queen e4, there's also knife f5 again. But again, computers being computers, they just say that after knife f5, I can just take the pawn. If rook g7, I always have queen e1, forcing the queens off the board, and I'm never in any danger. So knight d5 would have been the best move. But again, I was very low on time, and I played king h8 specifically because I had an idea in mind. So now I go knight c6 here. Andre trades. And goes e7. Now it's worth noting that when I calculated the whole king h8 line, I actually thought here that I was okay. I actually thought I was completely fine. And my initial idea was play this move rook b7. But much to my horror, I did realize that after rook b7, white can go queen f4 here. And it's very similar to the game that white is threatening rook g3, putting maximum pressure on g7. Additionally, if I take on e7 here, white swaps the rooks and then makes a check and wins my rook on e7. So I can't really do that. And besides that, there's nothing else I can really do here. I just resign. So there, there isn't anything I can do here. Additionally, um, well, not additionally, but that's why I basically, I realized that to my horror, I had to change my idea. I went king h7. I still thought that at this point I was okay here um, because I thought that after queen f4, I could go rook to b5 to meet this rook g3 idea with rook g5, and I, I'm completely fine. But at much to my horror, I realized after rook b5, white has h4 stopping rook g5. I just rook g3 next move, and I once again, I have to resign the game, and I do not qualify. So here I play rook g8, only move, of course, rook g3, and now I go queen e6 here. And now at least the pawn is protected, but still, you feel like all these pieces are so close to the king, the black king. It feels really, really sketchy at best. So he goes rook e3. I played queen g6. Now, queen d5 is another move here, but this is actually losing, because now white can go rook f8, rook e8, like in the game. Rook takes g8, I take, and now white can go rook f3 here. Again, threatening queen f8 check. I go back, and now after this beautiful beautiful move queen f8, the pawn guards the queen. White is just winning with the idea of rook f7. So one sample line would be queen g8, queen f5, king h8, queen d7, king h7. And just a very quiet move like king h2, and white will eventually gobble all these pawns on d6, c6, c4, maybe even a6, and it's cleanly winning for white. Cleanly winning, 
very little, uh, very little danger. So after rook e3, I play queen g6. He goes rook f8, rook e8 again, got to stop the pawn from promoting. He trades and plays queen c4, and now I play queen f7, and we reach move 40, and we reach the time control. Now, it's very critical that this was time control, because in this position, Andre had 30 minutes, and he fought for about 20 minutes before he plays the wrong move. In this position, there is one way for white to win the game without any issues. So the way to win this game here would be to play queen e6. Now, it's very counterintuitive, because here, as a human... You try to think about which end games can I win? And probably the last thought is that a rook and pawn end game is going to win because traditionally, as we know, we think of rook and pawn end games as being the most drawish. Um, so it's kind of like if you think the rook and pawn end game is probably drawish, well, then what do we go for? You have to go for one of these queen and pawn end games. And queen and pawn end games are still drawish, but a lot less so. However, in this position, the winning move was indeed queen e6. We trade, and now let's say I play c5 here. White can create the wide peepos here with b5. Very important move, and after pawn takes pawn, a6. Let's say I go uh, king f7. White goes rook to e3. And you'll notice if I ever move the rook to a8 here, white makes a queen. We trade, and then a7, a8 is simply winning for white. So I can't really allow that. And if I play b4 here, white goes a7 anyway. I go c4, and now white has the killer blow rook to f3 check. If I play king takes e7, there's rook e3 check, and white just trades, makes a new queen. And if I move the king to like g6 here, white goes rook f8 anyway, and I can't stop the wide peepos, and that's game over. So I can't really play c5 here. So the only other try is to go king f7, rook takes d6. Now there are two, two ways to capture. Um, the less optimal way to capture is rook e7. And after rook c6, if I play rook b7 here, white goes rook b6. I can't trade because the pawn is too fast, getting to the end of the board. And if I play rook e4 attacking the pawn, after rook b6, white guards guards uh, the pawn on b4 and keeps on the pawn on a6. And after king e7, king f2, I go king d7, king f3, say rook c4. White just has to march the king over to c3 and then capture the pawn on a6, and he's completely winning. The sample line would be king c7. King d3, rook f4, king to c3. Now white guards the pawn on b4, and white is ready to capture on a6. And with these two pass pawns, white should very simply win this game. However, so when we go back here, so the, the way that a human should capture is to play king e7, rook takes c6, and rook to b8. Now the reason this is a lot trickier is if white goes, let's just say white takes on a6, for example, after rook b4, king f2, rook b3, followed by rook a3, white is white White might be winning here, but it's going to be a very tricky rook and pawn endgame. It's actually quite similar to a rook and pawn endgame that I had against Wesley So in the Grand Chess Tour in Leuven in like 2018, where I did actually lose, um, where he had the rook in front of the pawn. So it's not so easy to, um, not so easy to, uh, not so easy to salvage it, but there are drawing chances. Any, at any rate, if white plays rook b6 here, it doesn't work because the king is one step closer. So after trading king d7, I am in time here to stop the pawn. So you can't go rook b6, but there's one critical move here. And I suspect that Andre didn't see this, which is this killer move rook to g6. And the reason this is crushing is if I take the pawn on b4, after rook g7, king f6, rook a7, white is going to win the pawn on a6 and just have two extra pawns. Very easy technical win. And if I go king f7, now white can go rook b6. Now the king again is one step too far away, and white gets the queen. So if, if Andre had seen this and found this line, he would have been winning the game. And he would have won the game, in fact. However, fortunately for me, Andre used about 20 minutes here, and he ended up taking the pawn on a6. Now, this is still... Good for white, but the problem with this end game is also for black, a lot of moves become straightforward. So I take the pawn, we trade, and now he takes. Now, in retrospect, I suspect that Andre should have played something like queen to f1 here, d5, queen to f4, and after queen b7, something like king h2 followed by queen d4 and queen b6. And while with correct play, this should still be a draw, black doesn't have obvious moves here. Black is going to have to come up with a plan for how to play this. Whereas in the game, Andre takes on c6, I check, and I take. And now it actually becomes very straightforward for me because I actually don't really have many moves. I basically only have queen moves. So he plays queen d5, I go here, and he goes queen a2. Now it's worth noting in queen and pawn end games here, it's really nice to get the queen behind the pass pawn. If you play something like a6 here, it's still quite tricky because I can play queen f4, g3, queen d2, queen g2, and now I can go queen a5 again. Trying to attack the pawn, you can't put the queen behind the pawn. After queen to d5, it's actually really unclear whether white can win this, especially because the white queen is so passive here. And I'm always threatening to make checks if you move the queen to like e6 or e8. 
So Andre played the move that I expected, which is queen d5, king h8, queen a2, trying to put the queen behind the passed pawn. Additionally, the white king is very, very safe because after queen f4, g3, queen d4, a6, queen a7, you'll notice there are no checks here. There's always queen f2, there's always h4, king h3, king g2. So white's never really in serious danger of um, of getting perpetual, of allowing a re repetition. So after, after g3, queen d4, it plays a6, queen a7, I have to stop the pawn. Of course, it's better to stop the pawn on 6th rank versus 7th rank. Obviously, it's it's one square away from queening here, so this would be winning. So I got to stop it when it's still two squares away. So here he plays h4. And now, as I said before, I don't really have moves. If I move my queen anywhere, white just pushes the pawn and wins the game. If I go h5 here, white can go queen to e2, attack the pawns. And this should also be winning for white, I think, with correct play. So I can't really push any of my pawns. I don't want to move my king either because now I think there might be some queen b1, queen b7. So what do I do? It is even material, and I do have a pawn that I can try to use to create, create counterplay. So here I play pawn to d5. Queen to e2 is played by Andre. And now I go queen to d4. Again, trying to get the queen behind this pass pawn. If white goes like king g2 and I get queen a4, now you can't really force the pawn up the board. So Andre correctly goes back. I go back to a7. Now he plays king g2. Of course, he doesn't want to draw. Obviously, that's uh, the last result he wants. Now I go d4. Again, pass pawn in a queen of pawn endgame. It's very important that you try to use your pawns. Plays queen e2. Stops the pawn push. Once again, if I can get this pawn to like d3, say I get this, for example. After d2, white's going to have to trade off the ace a pawn for the d pawn, and it will be a draw. So this is really my one hope. Get this pawn down the board. Now, I have looked at this a little bit with my trainer, Chris Littlejohn, after the game. And oddly enough, he said the computers say even if, even if, for example, we get some position like this where it's three versus two, this is actually still a draw with perfect play. Again, you don't want this, but the fact that the computer says even that is a draw says a lot about um, about the end game. So after king g2, I play d4. Andre goes queen e2, and now I play queen d7. Again, now I try to put my queen behind my pass pawn and force it straight down the board too. And here Andre makes a fateful blunder. He plays queen to e4. Now in this position already, I had a feeling that this was close to a draw because after queen d3, for example, even something like h5 followed by like queen a4, or queen c6, it feels like my pawn is too far advanced now. For example, say white goes king f2, even something like queen d8, queen a3, d3, it feels like this pawn is so far advanced that they're going to be good drawing, good practical drawing chances. However, Andre here, obviously tired, obviously after, after um, trying to find a win, he blunders with queen e4. Now, this allows me to insta-draw here with this move pawn to d3, of course. And Andre, I think, thought that... Uh, well, actually, let me show all the lines because there are a couple lines. If Andre played queen a8 check here, king h7, a7, trying to go queen e4 and make a queen, I actually just go queen to e7. I cut off the check on e4. Additionally, I keep an eye on the pawn. Additionally, I also have queen to e2 to draw the game. If white goes queen b8, for example, I just go queen e2, king h3, queen e6, king g2, queen e2. Very easy draw. And so there's no check. There's no queen b7. So queen b8 is the only move, and it's an easy draw. So queen a8 doesn't work. And after queen b7, I suspect Andre missed my next move because he played this pretty quickly. And as soon as I played my next move, there was a, sort of like an audible, I don't know if it was a groan, but you could tell from the expression on his face that he just missed my next move, which was that I played this very quiet move, queen to d8. I do not trade the queens because then after d2, white queens would check and I lose the game. But after queen to d8 here, now the pawn is just going. And after a7, I play d2. White makes a new queen. I get my second queen. And of course, I don't take because then it would be check once again. But by but by making the queen here, I guard my queen. And now we have two queens on the board each. But white has to trade the queens. And after queen d8, Andre offered a draw. Obviously, I would have recaptured. And now we have queen and two versus queen and two. A very standard draw. So when all is said and done, I do get a draw. I do advance to the semifinals. Very, very tough game. A lot to unpack, obviously. But I'm very glad that I was able to keep my nerves together. Uh, keep trying to find the best move. Keep playing on. Even when I thought in this queen and pawn end game, it was really, really dire. Uh, you just keep trying to find good moves. You keep trying to make your opponent have to uh, have to prove it. And Andre was not able to prove it. There were a couple moments he had some very good chances. But at the end of the day, I survive. I make the draw. And we move on to the semifinals, which will be happening on Friday. So I hope all you guys enjoyed this recap. Uh, it was obviously wild, wild game today. Um, and I wasn't initially planning on doing a recap, but I figured I've got the rest day tomorrow. Might as well do one. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button um, right below. Have a good one, you guys.